This is a Purple Line Express. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Kukatla, and I'm with Siebel Baker. In the middle of all of this, if your organization didn't have a decent culture, you were literally pushing a boulder uphill. The reality, though, is that life is about change. This is Merchandise Mart. Uh, welcome to the Wisendell Weekly Wrap-Up, where we talk about architecture, design, and everything in between. I have a special guest today. Uh, go ahead if you want to introduce yourself. I'm Bernie Dime, uh, President, CEO, Founder of Perspectives Limited. We provide uh, behavioral health services, uh, employee assistance programs, and organizational consulting. I am a trained social worker. Um, although I don't practice anymore, I run a business and we do a lot of work with organizations, leadership, and all levels of employees. Nice. Um, before we dive into that, I, I know you were just explaining to Sarah, and uh, shout out to Sarah uh, from Siebel Baker for hosting us today, and stay tuned for uh, after the podcast to hear a little bit more about uh, Sandler Seating. So um, so you were speaking to her about uh, where you grew up, Southside, and uh, where, where whereabouts again? Yeah, so I'm a Chicagoan born and raised, uh, south side of Chicago, uh, South Shore. Uh, I grew up there back in the 70s, 60s, 70s. Uh, raised my kids in uh, in the north suburbs, Wilmette, and uh, that's you, where I've been did since. Did you study in uh, Chicago as well? Study in so Illinois? I'm an Illinois guy. I okay. went to undergraduate. Uh, my undergraduate education was at the University of Illinois in Champaign. Nice. So then I came back and worked for a couple of years in social service and went to the University of Chicago. And uh, um, that's been very helpful because uh, I now serve on the um, advisory council of the School of Social Work there. And okay. Um, I've been very blessed because of the work I do. I've been able to leverage my expertise and the success I've had in doing community work. So I have a lot of community work in the community, if you don't mind my talking yeah, about yeah. that. No, 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 of course. I was the president of the it. board, and I'm still on the board for the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. So homelessness um, and ending homelessness is something that's very, very dear to my heart. Yeah. Um, inequities um, in, in terms of behavioral health treatment, which is what I do, yeah. is also something that I, I, I work very, very much to try and mollify and modify. I don't yeah. think that, I think this pandemic has caused those things to be even more obvious. Oh, and, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. people need help and it's harder if you're a person of color, if you're transgender, if yeah. you're different than the rest of us, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, man, oh man, there's so much to talk about. I mean, I know we're only covering here like right. 30 to 40 minutes, but there's so much to unpack. I, I guess as the basics, like what is a social worker? Like what? how does that differentiate from like a psychotherapist? Or um, I, I know they're kind of all related, but how, how would you define That's that? a great question. So all of us are in the helping professions. There's a number of different ways to provide service. Social workers, so let me start. Psychiatrists tend to be MDs, people who can medicate, provide medication. Uh, psychologists also can. They do a little more testing. Social workers do the same kind of thing other than providing medication. We all provide therapy of some kind. Um, social work also uh, has a tendency to be more systems oriented. So when we treat people, we treat people or work with people um, and again, it's really from a resiliency base, but we work with people who um, who are people in systems. So it's if I'm working with you, Felix, it's not because it's just you. It's what is your context? What is your life? Where are you at? Um, where does your family come in? Where does your current working space come in? Um, all of those things impact on your life, um, and they need to be figured in in how we help you to live a productive and happy and comfortable life. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and I know you, we met at the, or I, we became, I became aware of you at the uh, Cornette uh, luncheon um, of Armagianos. And uh, you said an interesting stat. I, I would get it mistaken, but uh, can you rattle that off if you have it off the top of your head about how many therapists there are to people and yeah. like that sort of, uh, I, th I think it's important to break that down first, right? Because um, there, there's a lot of different, uh, accessibility is always a, an issue, but not only accessibility, I think the sheer numbers uh, are staggering, so. Yeah, so if I can sort of digress a, bit, a little bit yeah, in order course. to put it in a context, right? So I think what we've seen in the last three or four years with the 
pandemic, COVID-19, and with um, a lot of the social inequities that have occurred, um, we've seen mental health rise to the, uh, the forefront. People are becoming more aware of it. Um, and like everything else, the supply side issues, to bring it to an economic point of view, um, that occur with respect to providing behavioral health services to people um, are relevant because the number of people demanding service, the demand for service for mm -hmm. behavioral health care has risen, which is a good thing. We've sort of destigmatized a little bit mental health. More people are willing to talk about it. But the, uh, the supply of therapists has remained the same. So the statistic you're referring to, <laughs> there's about 320,000 uh, million people in this country. Um, right now, about at any given moment, roughly 20 to 25% of those people need some kind of mental health services. Um, that would round down to about 65 million people. Um, there are about 700,000 therapists. So if you do the math, every therapist would have to see 90 to 100 people in their caseload. So I got to tell you, when I was doing therapy and I don't do it anymore, if I had 30 to 35 people, that was a lot. Um, so that's a really staggering number because there's so few providers and that's yeah. across the board. And it, that's a gross number. And, uh, and again, as I said, um, because of the demand and we live in a society that's dictated by supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's hard for people to find a therapist, it's right now to find a psychiatrist, it's you're six months out before you get in. And I do a lot of work with suicide prevention. And if you're at a place where you're ready to uh, die by suicide, it's really because you haven't been able to get treatment for some depression or anxiety or whatever. And waiting six months to see a psychiatrist is, I think, it's it's a it's a bob it's abominable it's yeah. it's an abomination so yeah we don't do so well in this country in yeah. terms of providing those services and and that's a larger bucket in healthcare in this country too right like i know personally uh, i've been having some vision issues uh this last week or two weeks and uh i, I just need to go get a general checkup and when i scheduled it didn't schedule me out till like january to see to see my primary um, and we're, there were that when I did, when I logged in and filed that, that was in the beginning of October. So it's just, it's, it's wild to, to, to think of the accessibility for sure. It is. I think, I think the most important thing in any kind of healthcare is access. Yeah. And I think, again, this is just my view. Yeah. I think our healthcare system is very broken. Yeah. Um, and it, we see that in good times, but it's even more obvious in bad times. Yeah. So you know, getting any kind of medical or mental health treatment, um, you know, unless you're really on death's door, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have to wait. Yeah. And that's really unfortunate. And, you know, the, the problem with behavioral health care, forgive me for sort of focusing on that, is no. that um, it's, it's kind of more silent. You know, mm -hmm. you have cancer, you have heart problems. It's pretty evident, right? Behavioral health care, people are pretty good at covering it. Very few people yeah. who are suicidal, when you ask them if they're suicidal, will go, oh, yeah, I'm suicidal you know, because nobody feels really comfortable doing that. So you get a lot of folks that are, I would call them the walking wounded. I mean, think about it. If you had cancer, um, and this is another statistic, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wonk when it comes I, to data. I, I, the, more, the more data, the better. So here's another statistic. <laughs> um, on average, from the moment somebody experiences symptoms of depression or anxiety, um, till the time they get treatment is 11 years on average. Wow. 11 years. So now let's go back to the cancer diagnosis, yeah. right? You get cancer and you wait for 11 years to get treatment, you're probably not going to be around in 11 years. Right. And right. so the fact that that's acceptable is unacceptable, yeah. right? So yeah. I think um, I think our system of, of services is is really woefully inadequate. Yeah. And with behavioral health, it's even worse. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, I, I would feel as though the pre-COVID and after COVID is a really big marker, right? And, and I guess how has that changed? And, and we'll, and for everybody listening, I mean, we'll, we'll circle this back into uh, workplace and, and the HR conversations that a lot of people are having. But I guess, again, on a bigger scheme, a bigger global view, before COVID, were people, I, I know you said that we've kind of uh, broken down the stigma, but have the... Um, 
uh, I guess, triggers been different pre-COVID than they are after COVID, or they're, they're just the same? So again, if, if we think of mental health or mental wellness on a continuum, um, and we think of stigma, and I really, I, I don't want to be misquoted in saying that there's no stigma anymore. Right. Mental health is still stigmatized. It's gotten easier. And I think the Gen Xs, the Gen Ys, these the millennials are a little more comfortable talking about it. But mm. I think what happened in March of 2020 was the world of work changed significantly. The yeah. world of education changed significantly. So um, people um, had to adjust not only to a different workplace and working environment and working arrangement, um, but they also had to assume different roles, right? So, you know, um, talking to Sarah, she has two kids. I mean, all of a sudden one day you're working and now you're a parent, not just a parent, but you might be home in the office teaching them now because yeah. school's not available or right. making sure they're getting the help they yeah. need and getting the education. Most of us weren't trained to be educators, right? right. right. Um, and we're cooking. And if you're in a relationship, your partner may not be the best at doing some of the housework. Yeah, so I, that creates, I am not. I am there not, you go. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I mean, my wife and I, when we were home, we would meet in our lunchroom, which is our kitchen, Yeah. you know, and, um, <laughs> you know, one of us would clean up and usually it was a fight and usually I was the one that was fighting, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, we assume different roles, greater stressors. Um, there's, you know, the, the beauty of being at work whether you're in your office at home or anyplace else, is that when you leave work and you go home, there's some time frame, mm -hmm. some distance for you to wind down, change gears, move into being a parent or um, a, a, a spouse or a partner. Those boundaries have blurred. Yeah. And so I think the levels of stress um, in terms of the confusion of all the roles has been greater. I also think that I think virtual is great, mm -hmm. but there's some downsides. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, I got to tell you, I'm doing more of these seminars now in person. I love it. I mean, yeah. virtual is great, but I love to be with people. I love mm -hmm. to talk to people and little boxes, whether it's on Teams or Zoom, doesn't really cut it for most people. Yeah. So that kind of human contact also. Yeah. You know, at the beginning of COVID, they used to say that um, introverts loved it. It's great for them. They got used to it. Extroverts hated it. If you talk to introverts now, they didn't like it anymore either. So, I mean, it got very wearing over three years. So yeah. I think all of those things exacerbated mental health. And I think the other thing it did was it um, it pointed up those disparities in access. Mm -hmm. so. and, and it's not only like when you think of uh, workplace, I mean, it's, it wasn't only the white collar, the workers that were affected, the blue collar as well, like drastically, right? Even having the you know, fear of losing your job is a huge stressor. Um, and I guess, do you see the differences between that? Is there any, uh, obviously you're a big data guy, but uh, what is the, what does that data say for those? So, you know, it's interesting. Again, I think the, the world changed significantly in the last yeah. three years. And I think the world of work and, you know, we talk about interior design, we talk about where we work. Um, I think organizations need to be and employers need to be much more cognizant of the environment. And mm -hmm. I don't think they were. So, you know, even factories, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, first of all, the insecurity of whether of knowing whether or not you're going to have a job because, I mean, look at the industries that were decimated, um, the concierge and hotel and restaurant industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're downtown Chicago, you see pretty quickly how sparse, how so many restaurants have gone out of business. And usually they're not the large ones, there's the small ones. So that means a lot of people are unemployed, right? Yeah. And um, and for employers, it's hard to find good employees or find employees because, you know, there's there people are not as willing to take jobs where they have to go into a, a business. So I think, the, again, the whole world of work has shifted. I think the data suggests that... Um, um, Industries, certain industries were affected more than others. Higher education is another example. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. If you have kids who were seniors in 2020 or 2021, yeah. they missed a whole year of socialization. And then they went to college. That first year of college, and I don't know about you, I'm an old guy. But when <laughs> I was in college, part of it was the learning. The other part was being with people, yeah. was learning how to be an independent 
adult. Yeah. And that stuff got changed. So those kids stayed home. And I think we've seen, we're starting to see the, um, the results, uh, suicide in, in teenagers and in, in, in young adults has, has risen, right? Wow. Suicide attempts have risen. Um, and again, the lack of resources makes it worse. Um, marriage has been a lot more divorce. Substance use and misuse mm-hmm. and substance use disorder has gone up. And, you know, from a, from a, a, a workplace culture point of view, yeah. you know, it's, it's really affected it. So I think, I think we're still reeling. And I don't know if this answers your question, but I don't think we've even scratched the surface of the impact that these last three years have had. And that's just assuming, I'm being very optimistic, that these three years are over and now everything's <laughs> going to be nirvana again, which yeah, we know is yeah. not the case. Right, right. right. So, yeah, yeah, I heard on the NPR that uh, uh, this morning that they were, you know, um, preparing for some uptick in, in cases coming up in the winter. And um, yeah, I mean, there's there's just a ton to unpack there. It, it, I guess, like, we, when you talk about systems, like when you see companies um, not only think about space or like space planning, but it's really about the, the programming of the companies to take the well-being of their individuals as a priority, right? And spending the actual dollars to invest into that, right? Like, I guess, what, what are some examples that you've seen or that, you know, it could be case studies in a, on a larger national scale that, that you really relate to or, or like that they're implementing? So it's interesting. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, even before the pandemic, uh, I think there was a there was pressure on employers to think about the culture of the organization, both mm-hmm. the physical and the emotional culture. The you know that 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 really makes a difference. And and if you want to be purely economic about it, people are more productive when they're personally feeling like they've got their acts together. They have support. Um, so just that's not where I come from, but <laughs> just starting with that, yeah. employers have a lot to gain by doing that. Yeah. Um, but then it's, I think, the right thing to do. And I think what you, especially now, where it's harder to retain and recruit people, good people especially, people are, they're not idiots. You know, they know if the culture of an organization is no good, right? right they understand right. that. So, you know, we see some of the larger organizations, uh, the Amazons and the, um, you know, um, you know those, com- those companies, the, the, the Facebooks, right now mm-hmm. called Meta, right? Mm-hmm. We see that the culture has always been sort of neglected in some ways with the growth. And now people are pretty much saying, I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. you got to come to me and you got to treat me well. And it's really yeah. unfortunate that organizations didn't take that into account earlier. And I, I will say this, that I think that in the middle of all of this, if your organization didn't have a decent culture, you were literally pushing a boulder uphill. Mm-hmm. It may have been too late to retain that culture, but at least if you started, you could do that. Um, you know, those organizations that have done well and survived, I think are the ones that had a very transparent, uh, supportive culture. And again, you can do all that and yet hold people accountable, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And, and the other thing I do want to just mention is that um, I think the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues are huge, huge. And I think, again, have also been neglected and yeah. you know the George Floyd incidents the all that stuff have really made it imperative for people to look at this I'm I'm going to be speaking tomorrow to a group of school superintendents and district administrators and security personnel I don't have to come up with creative stuff unfortunately there was another shooting just yesterday um, you know the fact that there are shootings in schools the fact that you go into a school now and you have to go through security checks, that there's only one entrance. Even if the school is as safe as can be, you know the stress that those kids are under, that those parents are under, that those teachers and faculty members are under. So I really think this, you know, we all have to kind of step back and and kind of figure out what we need to do culturally yeah. and politically. And I won't even get into the yeah, politics that, of whole, it because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, you know, we, we don't have good role models. I'm not going to take a side on either side yeah, of, yeah. The, of the aisle in, in Congress, but these are people who don't behave well. And yeah. that's the message it gives to to our kids, to, you know, to everybody. It's it's OK to misbehave. It's OK to, you know, to to be angry and act out your anger, you know. Yeah. So, again, I, those organizations that are um, 
are thriving, surviving, doing more than surviving, are the ones that I think take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah. I, I was really glad that you brought up that diversity. Or you, 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 you made it a note at that luncheon about the diversity and inclusion because it is a factor, right? And and you know, if I go on LinkedIn today, everybody's calling for people to come back to the office, like quit playing the games and all this jazz. You know, nobody wants to work. It's like, no, I think you're right. Like they they now want you to tell me why why should I be there? You know. Yeah, I have the upper hand because you need me now. And, and, you know, I, so I guess what is your like return to work thought or, or, because I'm I'm sure you've had dealt with a a range of people uh, on on the different spectrum of that. Yeah. So again, there are certain industries where that conversation is really irrelevant. I mean, manufacturing, they still haven't figured out a way to do that remotely. Right. I mean, for the most part, but in most, I think workplaces, I, Look, I, I think even more so now, but I've always felt that communication and transparency is really the answer to all of this stuff. So there's two sides to communication. There's the talking part and there's the listening part, mm-hmm. right? We don't always do so well on the listening end of it. And I think employers, if they really want to um, engage people and come up with a solution, and I say that somewhat vaguely because I think, again, each company, each organization each workplace, each market sector might have different needs and different requirements. But if if we really want it to be successful, it's got to be a dialogue. Yeah. And I think that the companies that sit down and have conversations about what they need and what their employees need are able to come up with better solutions. There's no perfect nirvana. But even in our company, I mean, we literally on March 12th went from everybody in our office to everybody working remotely. And getting people to come back has been a real challenge. So one of the things we did, I did as a leader, was we started having Zoom um, town hall meetings every other week, just a half hour during lunchtime. How's it going? Here's what's going on in COVID. How can we connect? And we didn't have to, it wasn't mandatory. Literally, we would have anywhere between 80 and 95% of the people show up. And I think we kept the conversation going, even to the point of saying, you know, here's what's going on in COVID. What are we going to do? We don't know. Yeah. I mean, we've tried to have a return to work um, get together three or four times. (laughs) And, you know, we've had conversations with our employees and they're still feeling afraid. And the reality is, and this may sound superficial, but I do believe that perceptions are more important than realities. So, if, if people are f- afraid and you tell them that it's ridiculous to be afraid, and even if the facts support that it's ridiculous to be afraid, you're not acknowledging their fear and you're not taking it seriously. And really, I think what we all want is to be taken seriously and heard. Yeah. So if we can hear that, then we can really kind of get through that. And I think those the, the organizations, again, I'm, I hope I'm making some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The organizations that survive, that thrive, that get back to some semblance of normalcy, whatever that means, are the ones who have those open dialogues with um, mm-hmm. with their employees. And, and, and how do you, like, what are some pointers that you give to keep some of those? I, I know every, I'm sure it's case by case, but the communication uh, is huge in the transparency, but are, are there more like processes, I guess, or like HR, like implemented? No, you like you have to attend this. I, and of course, nobody wants to be told what to do. Uh, regardless, and it's told to socialize, but are there like mandatory things of that nature? I, I, I know that mandates from companies are, are often uh, uh, pushed back on, so uh, uh, and rightfully so. So, well, no, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think, again, um, I mean, look, there are certain things and there are certain elements of what we do that are requirements. I mean, they're, they're non negotiable, right? If, if, if you have to be in the office because you have to do something, you have to be in the office because you got to do something. On the other hand, getting people together, having meetings, what's going to work for that particular group or that organization? And I think some organizations are sort of, they're a very bureaucratic, top-down, authoritarian structure. Um, They're going to have more difficulty, I think, in gaining some consensus and bringing people together. So I think HR has got to be very creative. I think, look, one of the things we did uh, at the at the very beginning was, I was saying my son owns a flower business, right? Yeah. Flower, flowers for Dreams. And um, they shifted their business model 
um, and started doing corporate events. And literally what they would do is they would, we had a terrarium building um, Zoom event. Mm -hmm. They literally delivered to every home a terrarium. We then had a 45 minute terrarium building event. Nice. And it was fun, it yeah. was facilitated. Mine died because I have a, a black thumb. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work for me. But those were all conversations and ways to bring us together. To this day, we have a social committee that meets via Zoom. We're going to have some people. We're going to try and have some people come back for a holiday party. Yeah. Maybe after the first of the year, but we're going to do it. Yeah. And again, it's, you know, we've had HR and a group of employees um, working on that together. Yeah. And, you know, we try and support them with the financial and the logistics, but we want them to plan it. And to mm -hmm. the extent that it's appropriate, we're going to support it. Sure. So um, I think, again, those conversations, those transparencies. And the other thing as a leader is um, if you don't know something, say you don't know it. Yeah. Don't make it up. Yeah. And if you're transparent about it. So we've had people ask questions. And when they've asked me questions and I don't know the answer, I always say, I don't know the answer. Yeah. But I will do my best to find it and get back to you. And then I do. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I get back to them and say, couldn't find it. But the fact that they know I'm thinking about it and I am taking it seriously, I think goes a long way. Yeah. So definitely. I think that's what that kind of a culture. And that's the other thing I talked about. A culture of safety, psychological safety is important, right? Mm -hmm. Creating an organization where there is no tolerance for bullying, where um, communications is important, where everybody listens to one another, where there's support for that. Um, and there's, um, you know, some very clear guidelines and limits to what you can and can't do mm -hmm. make a huge difference because mm -hmm. they create a safe environment and they make it easier for people to, to talk about their mental health. So yeah. I have this fantasy. Uh, don't take this the wrong way. It's not that kind of <laughs> fantasy, but I have this fantasy where, you know, right now, if somebody goes into the CEO and says, I need some time off because I have been diagnosed with cardiovascular issues. And the CEO goes, whatever we can do to support you. I have this fantasy that somebody will be able to go into that CEO someday and say, you know, I was just diagnosed with a bipolar disorder. Um, I need some time off to deal with that. That they'll get the same level of treatment and respect. Um, to do that, though, we have to openly con communicate about that. And we have to honor it and not be afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Suicide is another issue. Talking about suicide is not going to cause suicide. Yeah. Quite the contrary. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. it makes it okay for people to talk about it. Yeah, so, and, and it is always tough to talk about that. For sure. Absolutely. Huge, huge one, right? And so one of the things we do, and a lot of organizations do, and organizations can get this on their own, is what's called mental health first aid, right? And, and if you think about it, it's like we all learn CPR, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to learn CPR, not all of us, but we learn. You don't have to be a physician or a nurse or a medical professional. You learn how to spot problems and what to do to sort of mediate things until you get somebody in to help or to make a decision about whether you should call somebody. Same thing can be done with mental health. Yeah. If we do that, we make it less stigmatized and easier for people to do that. And then we all kind of take care of each other, right? Mm -hmm. Um that's, mm -hmm. I think, where we're at. Anyway, yeah. that's that's what I... Yeah. And, and, and you were mentioning uh, uh, when we talked before about how you... Well, part of what you guys do is also coaching the CEOs to be willing to tell the person with bipolar disorder it's okay, right? And, and I think that uh, how do you convince someone who is all numbers and, and more of the, uh, you know, authority... Author, authority that it's okay that this person needs to do it. Because in their mind, I'm sure, and hopefully not, but it's a production going down, right? Production or value going down. Yeah. And, and I think that's a big part of it, right? That's why people don't acknowledge mental health is because you feel like you're devalued or you're less of because of your, you know, you're having a stressful few weeks, right? Right, so. right. I mean, I, I think for a long time, people saw people who were struggling with mental health issues, especially with depression, as as being malingerers. Remember that term? That's mm -hmm. an old term, malingerers. No. You know, you're 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 just malingering. You're using this as an excuse. Okay. There's a new Illinois law that I think is great for schools, which I just learned about about six months ago. It started, it, it was enacted in January, it began in January of this past year. Mental health days, every student should get five mental health days. Interesting. Mental health days. 
Now, why is that so important? Because they can take time off. They could take sick days, you know, call in sick. It's important because it's a way to destigmatize it, right? Yeah. It's a way to say, hey, you know what? If you got a cold, you take, you take a day off for a cold. You got mental health, take mental health day off. And no questions asked. Yeah. So there's, if you want to take a mental health day off, you do it. Now, will there be people who will judge and say, oh, that Felix is... Yeah. He's looking for a way to get out. And will there be people who do that? Absolutely. Right, right, right. There are people that do right. that all the time. But right. I think what we're doing is we're opening up the ability for people to get that help. And if people do take more than five days, then a counselor reaches out to that child or reaches gotcha. out to that family and says, hey, look, is everything OK? Can we help in some way? Yeah. Again, it's it's really about, about being more proactive. Why don't we do that in workplaces, too? Mm -hmm. I mean, organizations that have PTO, um, you take part, you take paid time off. Nobody says to you, well, are you, are you sick or, you know, it's, it's really okay. Yeah. I think we're just afraid of mental health. Yeah. Well, I, so all, people always say, well, where are you going? You know, when do you take PTO? Well, sometimes, and then there's that line, right? Where it's like, well, it's really none of your business where I'm going, you know, <laughs> why I'm taking it off. That's you know? right. That's and, right. and, uh, you know, I know a lot of companies tout the, or some companies <coughs> tout the uh, unlimited PTO, right? Like take it whenever you want it. But for some people, they never take the PTO, right? And, and uh, that that is interesting uh, for sure. I, I think um, one of the big ones, and I know we were talking about uh, television and uh, therapy. I mean, The Sopranos is big, a huge show, right? And therapy is a huge uh, component of that show that I think a lot goes overlooked by by all right you yep. see this big intimidating man and but really he is going to therapy almost every episode and and I think that often gets very overlooked for sure well I think you're right and I I, I would love to see and it's it's gotten much better therapy be painted in a very positive light yeah right because right. you know I mean yeah. there's still yeah. what is there a new show and I love the show the patient Okay. Um, with I seen um, it. oh, what's his name from? Um, um, oh, oh uh, um, Steve Carell. Steve Carell. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. You know, it's about a guy who's a, <laughs> a, a, a sociopath, and he's chained to a bed. And and again, it's a great show. But you know what? Therapy is a, it's okay. It's okay for people to go for therapy. It's okay to talk to somebody. I mean, yeah, I mean that's an extreme case. Yeah, right? Right, right, but right. there's there's more people in shows. Yeah. that are getting therapy now. Yeah, so it's becoming more mainstream. And um, you know, I I think it's a good thing. I yeah. I think unfortunately the other piece to this is that, um, like everything else, there are people who or 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 entities that come into the field and exploit the marketplace, right? Yeah. So. There certainly has been no dearth of um, medication, psychotropic, me psychotropic medication yeah. commercials, yeah. Um, you know, out there. And I'm, I, I believe in medication for people. I just don't believe in medication that's given out willy nilly as a sure. cure. Sure. You know, I mean, I think some people just need medication. Some just need therapy. Some need some combination. Yeah. Some need self help programs. There's a lot of resources out there. Yeah, and I definitely. Think, you know, I think that everybody should be exposed to all the different yeah. ones. Yeah, it's it, that, that's funny you bring up the patient because uh, <laughs> I, I do remember seeing it and I was like, wow, that's pretty extreme. But there's a uh, show called Atlanta. It's a predominantly black show and uh, Childish Gambino. And he has a therapy session or there's an episode where he is going to therapy. And they made the experience. They did it so well. And I was so happy that they showed that experience that's it's great. so positive, right? Um, because typically in the minority community, therapy is not available, right? And they show that experience being so well. And he was so happy and the viewer was happy and it, it was it was great. I, I just I couldn't uh, couldn't pr pr praise it anymore. No, and sure. I think that's important. I think we need to promote these things yeah. in positive ways. And, you know, I mean, again, I think the younger generation gets it a little more. I yeah. mean, I, I jokingly say there are times I'm walking to the train and I'm listening to somebody on their cell phone and either they're having some kind of a marital spat and they don't care that I'm listening yeah. or they're talking to their therapist, right? Yeah. And it's like, they don't seem to care. You know, I worry about HIPAA and I should as a therapist. Yeah. They don't care. You yeah. know, so in some ways there's sort of an issue with boundaries. Sure. In other ways, I think it suggests that there's a little more comfort in talking about mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. Again, I... I think there's an appropriate place to do that. Of course. Of I course. don't want people knowing about my therapy yeah, or yeah. that I'm having an argument with my kids or my wife. Yeah. But, you know, to be able to share that news 
you know, to, to feel that it's, it's a resource that's available is good. But again, yeah. you know, we're struggling to find enough resources. For, for sure. And, and the technology, right? That uh, um, there's apps out there now and there's e easier ways to, to get therapy and hopefully, you know, but again, nothing beats being in person or, or having that conversation. Uh, but there are ways to, to kind of chip off of the, uh, the mountain of, of mental health for well, sure. And that's why I, I'm, I'm very biased. Obviously mm -hmm. I believe that what we do is really works well. We provide employee assistance programs, right? Mm -hmm. Which have a mixed bag of reputation, but yeah, and what, it, what is that employee assistance? So we basically contract with organizations to provide a certain select group of services to people. Right. And that can be everything from just assessment and referral to resources to short term brief, counseling to management referrals to um, case management to prevention oriented seminars and 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 work with people and it the the relationship between me and the corporation between the EAP and the corporation is 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 there's still a confidential wall so that what we hear about is not a part of the company it doesn't go back to the company the only person that can tell the company um, unless they're threatening to do something terrible to somebody, is the person that's being seen for the help. But what I think is good about EAPs is that we are sort of the triage point for people, right? You come in, unlike when you have a broken leg and you go to the emergency room and you know they're going to set your leg, most people, when they're dealing with a mental health issue, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what to do with it. Um, and so they're much more um, unaware of the options. Our job is to make them feel comfortable, gather as much information as we can, and provide them with the resource or resources that are necessary. So it's kind of like we're the archer with the quiver. And in the quiver, we have the apps, we have the medication, we have the therapy, we have the network, we have all these things. So you come into me, I do the assessment, I start thinking, well, you know, here's there's a bunch of stuff going on. Maybe you're having some trouble with your kid and maybe your partner is, you know, is drinking too much or using cocaine or is addicted to, you know, some other medication. Um, I'm going to gather information, try and get you to the right places, make sure you can afford it. So my quiver has got all these different arrows in it. Oh, you you know, this this cow map might work for you. And oh, by the way, I know a therapist who works really well with gay couples. And oh, and by the way, you know what? Maybe you need to go to a self-help group because you're strong. All of those things, um, we become the sort of guide to them, right? We become the person that, uh, the organization that, the entity that gets them where they need to go and then make sure that they're getting what they need, right? Mm -hmm. That's different than just picking up the yellow pages in the old days or calling uh, an app um, yeah. and doing it yourself. Yeah. You may get lucky. Sure. You may not. Sure. That's so I feel very strongly that I think most people don't really know yeah. what their their issues are mental health wise and where to go and, and what to get for, for help. And, and taking that a step further and apologies if this is too forward, is is that like a retainer that companies pay you guys or how does that work? So usually the we get paid by the company and again it's confidential. So right, right. it can be it can be done very similar to the arrangement with insurance where there's a okay. sort of a premium that the employer, not the employee pays, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, uh, per employee per month, yeah. uh, per year, whatever it is, or a fee for service, but everything's confidential. Yeah. So um, the relationship between the employee or their family member, because we cover family members too, because, you know, yeah. <laughs> You know, when you go when you go to work at, in the morning, you don't lock into your locker, open it up, put all your problems in there, go to work, then come <laughs> back and pull them out again. I mean, that doesn't happen. We yeah. we bring these things with us, so our our family members might be affecting us the night before. Your son or daughter may have had a problem with alcohol or drugs or been arrested. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to go to work the next day feeling like, oh, everything's cool. I'm yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. So. We need to help you and your son and your daughter or, or your family. Um, so all of those are covered. And the goal is to try and get you the right help you need mm -hmm. so that you can live a better life, mm -hmm. both outside of work and at work. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I guess out of, I, I, I mean, I keep thinking and reverting back to almost like programming of space. Like if you're, if you're talking to, 
I, I would assume their work becomes into it, right? And then they would talk about the obstacles that they would that they have in order maybe to perform their job and like all of that information. Are you, are you um, deciphering that back to management about saying, hey, well, maybe you guys should do something like this in order to do that? Or I guess, how does it affect space? Yeah, so that's interesting. So, um, so from a, from an organizational point of view, um, there are themes that we find mm -hmm. and we report that back to the right. institution or the organization and make recommendations that they can take or not sure. um, about um, what to do. So for instance, um, if we're finding that there's a bad manager and because of the work arrangement, everybody's out in the open and nobody feels like they have privacy, we're going to go back and say, you know, there have been a number of situations here with this manager <laughs> and they just don't feel like they have the privacy. Yeah. So there's an issue with the manager. There's an issue with the structure of the way the place is set up. Yeah. And, you know, we can't tell you what to spend your money on, but if you want your work group to be more effective, maybe, maybe you should have an open concept or maybe you should create a small... A conference room where people can go in there and just make f personal phone calls and yeah. sign up for it or whatever. And by the way, you should deal with the manager, right? Yeah. And um, we don't break confidentiality, but unless there's a job performance issue yeah. and then there's a release of information for us to speak with the manager HR, and that's really not about what they're going through, but it's about whether or not they're getting better at their job. They're, they're showing up, they're correcting whatever it was that was wrong. Um, it's irrelevant and unimportant to the manager what that person's struggling with. Mm -hmm. It's more important that they're doing what they need to do to mm -hmm. stay on the job, to work, or to get off the job, but to, to make sure they keep their employment. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, this would be the last, I mean, I mean, it's kind of a big topic, but uh, change, yeah. right? Because that's what you're talking about, like <laughs> change, either change management, change in the individual, I guess. That's, I mean, that's very difficult to do. I, I know that uh, COVID really pushed a huge change, right? And, and it's still rippling to the to effect till this day. But I guess can you talk about change or how people can handle change a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so in general. Yeah. So that's a great that's a great <laughs> point. I will say that I don't think people are built yeah. to deal with change well. Really. I just don't think we are. Yeah. I think overall, um, none of us like change. We like, and we may argue that, but we get into a rhythm. And we get into a, a routine and we don't want to change. The reality, though, is that life is about change. Mm -hmm. And so that struggle is something we all have to deal with, right? Yeah. And I, I, I really do think the only thing that's constant in life is change. Yeah. And so what I think happened in the last three or four years is I don't think there's, I don't think that the problems are different. I think the magnitude of the problems are different, and I think the slope of the curve has changed. So, for instance, if we look at technology, technology was on the, on the way up, right? It was changing. I think what ended up happening was COVID made it go like this, right? All of a sudden, there weren't people doing hybrid jobs. Everybody was virtual, right? Now we're trying to get back to some semblance of, you know, I don't know, some semblance of what Normality. we maybe yeah. feel comfortable with. But again, I think it's important. Change management is tough and it's it's a road that we're on. And I think it starts with the acknowledgement that change is tough and that we're all in this together and we just have to accept the fact that we have to change. Organizations that don't change, people that don't change, die. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to sound, you know, morbid, but they I want really to make sure do. you have the back of the microphone on the oh, back because on that one, because that one's that was a good one. Yeah, you had it right. Okay. Yeah. So, so wait, I, no, I think now you have it backwards. The back, the back yeah, the back front? is on back. Back is on back, right? Yeah. Okay. So the back is. So the back it should be away from you. Oh, okay. Sorry. There you go. That's so where change, it was. Okay. So change. That, so yeah. change. Sorry. Because <laughs> that was a good one. So, I want to make sure. We so heard I want to make one. sure I change the microphone. <laughs> Correct. No, I think so. I think the reality is that um, the only constant in the world is change. Yeah. And. I think the way to deal with it is to acknowledge it and work together to get through it. Yeah. We do a lot better when we work in teams um, to get through it. And that doesn't mean that you can't be an individual or you can't have your own, you know, bring your own thing to the table. It just means that we need to acknowledge it. It's the same thing with diversity. I mean, we focus on diversity and I think the beauty of diversity, whether it's with respect to gender, sex, uh, race, religion, the beauty of it, it, it also applies to 
experience, it applies to expertise. We all bring something different to the table. And if we can use that to help us sort of move forward, then I think it makes change and the, the journey of change a lot easier. It's like, you know, the train has left the station. Either we get on the train or we stay in the station. If we stay in the station, we're not going anyplace. Right. So, right. you know, I think, I think we just have to realize that. And I think what's happened in the last three years is that that change has been huge. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think we're still reeling from it. And again, we don't even know the ramifications. I mean, I don't know what kids are going to be like who've grown up in this. I have a grandson who's three years old. And we notice he's a little shyer than, he's not normally that shy. I think he's shyer because in some ways he wasn't exposed to people in yeah. the same way that you and I were. And, you know, and he had a mask on his face, right? Yeah. And that has, that has an, an impact as well. And he was in a box, right? I mean, I was sure, and we don't live too far from each other, but there was a period of time that we weren't seeing each other other than on FaceTime. Yeah. And I was sure that at some point when he saw me in person, he was saying, he was looking at me going, how come there's not a box around your head, you know? <laughs> so yeah. that's, that normal was normal for him. Yeah. That's not normal. And yeah. now he's adjusting to that. So. Yeah. And, and uh, what, what do you see any trends or for the 2023? What, what, uh, what's the outlook look like? That's an interesting question. So I think we're still going to be grappling with how to move to this next sort of step and stage. And, you know, for a long time, people were talking about the new normal. Yeah. I don't think that's a concept that makes any sense. I think it's the next normal. Because I think what, we, what we're going to see is we're going to see people adjusting now to workplaces. So um, what's going to happen to offices? Yeah. You know, how do we deal with that? What's going to happen to um, how we communicate, right? Um, I think that we're going to hit another plateau. And I think... People are still nervous about COVID and what that's going to mean um, over the next winter, right? Mm -hmm. If you're living in Chicago, we're all about to get stuck inside a little more, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that going to mean? How's that going to be? Um, and and on the other side of that is, I think there are people who um, who are they don't think you should wear masks. They don't think you should get vaccinated. So the, the other thing that I think has happened and I think is still, we're going to feel the residuals of this is, is this polarity, the polarity of thought, right? It's not as if people sit down and go, okay, you believe that, I believe this. Well, there's something in the middle. It's, I'm right, you're wrong. And think about our media too, because we get all of our information from media that basically supports our viewpoint, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you're a conservative, you're watching Fox. Mm -hmm. If you're a liberal, you're watching MSNBC. You're not necessarily hearing the other side of the story mm -hmm. in a positive way or in a way that facilitates understanding other people. Yeah. And um, I, I think we're, we're going to be struggling with that. So I think this next year, workplaces, um, and especially real estate, we're seeing that. I think people are trying to figure out what to do with all this office space. space yeah, and yeah. it's starting to come back, but not quickly enough yeah. and i don't think it'll ever get back to where it was what are we going to do with businesses and you know small businesses which is the engine of our country um hiring people mm -hmm. i mean so i think i think we're still sort of in this sort of gray area although yeah. i think there's a little more hope and optimism hopefully yeah. that'll stay interesting well I, I look forward to seeing it with you uh where can people reach out to you or how do they look into perspectives or? yeah so perspectivesltd.com um feel free to come to the site uh they can reach me at bsd at perspectivesltd.com too be more than happy to send information or or answer any questions i can um I certainly were active on social media on Twitter and on um, um, LinkedIn and Facebook. And, um, you know, so our job is to try and promote getting good, get, taking care of yourself and awesome. getting help. Love it. Well, thanks. thanks, Bernie. I appreciate it so much. And uh, thank you for being open to joining as well. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Kukatla, and I'm with Siebold Baker. 
Uh, we're in the Sandler seating showroom here in the Merchandise Mart. We more recently got a brand new space in the northwest corner of the building, which we're quite proud of. Um, Sandler Seating is a brand within our portfolio that has serviced the North American market for about 25 years. Uh, they are majors to the likes of Hyatt and Marriott, etc. And Sandler provides contract grade furniture. These products don't have extraordinarily large lead times and you're still getting product that, you know, as a specifier or as an end user is exactly what you want. Um, it allows unique branding and creation of space um, that is outside of the box. So if you would like some more information, if you would like to visit our showroom, um, please contact us at seaboltbaker.com, certainly at sandlerseating.com, or my email is sarah, S-A-R-A, at seaboltbaker.com. Thanks, everyone. Your safety is important. If you observe unattended packages, vandalism, or suspicious activity, inform CTA personnel immediately.